So the ball slam activity should primarily be done for a really fast concentric flexion activity. Okay, so if you think about the flexor chain, which you may have seen a video on toes to rings just a little while ago, you know, a fantastic one you can do for that flexor chain when your hands are closed. So now, in order for me to do a flexor chain activity and to go this way, it would make sense that I would have to have a load in my hand in order to go that way because if I was just to go like this, then I am using, you know, my hip flexors and my abs to get down into a, you know, a, um, an athletic position, but there's no load to get there. So if I wanted to make it more challenging, I have to have load to go this direction. Most of our flexor chain is generally a more fast twitch pattern, okay? So, you know, long head of tricep, through fibers of the pec, you know, rex abdominis, some parts of the anterior portions are hip. They're set up to do shit that's really quick, right? Raise your hip up in a sprint. Um, these movements are there for primarily to throw, punch. It's natural for us to do that. And when we sprint and run really fast, that flexor chain has to, has to work so quickly, sometimes not even under a high amount of load, in order to rotate us that makes us go fast in that direction. So I start with this because this is a useless exercise. That's basically called lifting a ball up and then dropping it down. So if you're gonna call the exercise lift the ball up and then drop it from overhead, then call it that. Don't call it a ball slam. But if you're doing it as a fast flexion activity, there's a couple of things you have to consider for the client that you're working with. Number one, they have to overcome the weight of the ball. So what I mean by that is that they have to throw it with a right kind of speed that makes them work a little hard to move it but they have to own the speed. And I'm not sure if I can grab, yeah, let's try this, Emma. Let's try another a heavier ball. Yes, this would be the one. So this is 40 pounds, right? So I'm a pretty strong, robust individual, so it's quite possible I may blow this ball up, <laughs> but no. Just watch with the 40, look at the difference in this. Actually, that looked pretty good. So if I had a heavier ball, <laughs> I just try to pick up the 80, but if I had a heavier ball and I tried to do that, I'm hoping it would make sense. So watch the, watch the 40 in relation to the 20. I think this is a 20. Watch this. Right, you see that? So I can overcome the weight. There's been a lot of research on true power development, and in power development, you know, a lot of people work at this 25 to 35% of the one RM or that movement to create the right kind of activation in the movement to get the best response from that. So how in the hell though am I gonna be able to do a one RM of a ball slam, right? Just think about that, there's no chance of it happening. No, I'm not gonna try with the 80 or the 150. There's no chance of us developing a one RM. So all the coach can go on is choosing a ball or a specific weight that's gonna make the person recognize that they're moving it and it's not moving super fast um, because they have to have some challenge to it, but they have to overcome the load, right? So if it's a real heavy one and they're just like, oh, and they can't actually move the ball through space, then you need to lower the load, okay? Other things to think about uh, is that you have to have a ball, of course, that's gonna hit and not bounce up. So a lot of coaches make that mistake with you know, medicine balls that are somewhat bouncy, and you teach the slam ball with something else, and then your client's like, oh, you know, that ball's not available, I'll go use a, uh, a medicine ball and they slam it and they can get punched in the face. And also a reason why I don't like those bouncy balls, if the person slams it and they know the ball is gonna come back up, it's almost like you know, snatching as opposed to throwing a barbell. If you know you're gonna let go of something, you're not concerned about catching it, right? So just think about that. But if I throw this ball and I know there's a chance it's gonna come back up and hit me in the face, what do you think is gonna to happen to the power of me throwing the ball down? That's right, you're gonna think twice about throwing it as fast as possible. But we don't want that, because we want to have a fast concentric action when people do it, okay? Um, carryover of this for skill, for, uh, for other things, there's not a lot of massive transfer that you could really think of, but there's, honestly, there's not a lot of massive transfer to anything that we do in fitness over to a sport or functional environment, because where in the hell am I gonna do that in my life, right? Or how is that gonna be applicable? Don't say soccer, because it's not. How that's gonna be applicable to what I'm gonna do in a sporting scenario 
is unheard of. So we use the slam ball to train the pattern of a somewhat moderate load fast concentric action because this flexor chain works really good for fast explosive activities, okay? So what you want to do is think about that and say, yeah, so I probably don't want to do it, you know, 50 for time with a heavy load. Yeah, you can try, you know, for shits and giggles, but guess what's going to happen when that weight gets heavier over time? You know, that ball slam is going to be like, yeah, that was a slam. I just turned that, you know, because you know, if I get to rep 42, 43, 45, I'm not going to be trying to get that slammed as hard as possible, right? I'm going to be thinking about the time. So your brain is going to recognize that. So what you're looking for each time for a ball slam is sequestering this exercise in a pure skill or activation environment. So I love ball slams for that purpose, to activate that flexor chain, to move very quickly, and to not put it into a semi-capacity-based environment because people can't brace effectively and they will not recognize that they're not getting any carryover from the speed of the fast twitch you know, uh, motor units that they're supposed to be activating. And if that doesn't make sense, think of this way. You're not going to say do ring dips and then do power cleans and something else and then get out on the track and sprint 80 meters all out and then repeat that nine times. You know, some people are like, well, it's not bad. Well, no, it's not a good idea because you can't get the maximal expression of the sprint. I hope that makes sense. So it's the same thing with the ball slam. It just does not belong in capacity environments because the human will know over time, how do I get this done more effectively for time? I'll just lift it up and let it drop. I mean, why throw it to the ground and waste energy if you can just pick it up and drop it? So best prescriptions for this are in low repetition scenarios, like three to six repetitions, and you're focusing more like a like a power snatch submax set, if that makes sense for you as coaches, where you want great speed and great quality of movement, where you'll feel that like speed through the midsection, or sorry, speed through the middle of the movement, and you'll hear that ball hit. And when you start to feel that the power starts to drop on the movement and that's diminishing, the set should be over, right? So what you want to see is, you know, the set to look like this. And when it's like, you know, when I'm slowing down and the power starts to diminish, I'm actually pressing save with shitty powerful reps. So I'm not carrying that over to any movements like toes to bar, sprinting, or anything that I'm going to be doing in that, in that environment where I want the transfer of that activity, okay? So can you pair it in an EMOM with something else that has maybe an extension mechanism? I think that's a fantastic idea. Or some other med ball practice, that's great. But don't be using it uh, specifically in exercise selection for another exercise. You're like, oh, how do we create capacity around that? Um, it's just not, not going to be super effective for a whole ton of people. Have I done it before? Yeah, I have. But let me just tell you that playing it out in like 30-second pieces or doing AMRAPs in a minute or stuff like that, it really just turns into a shitty pattern of exercise. So there's, there's, all I'm saying is that there's other movements that you can choose in that time frame to get the same kind of dose response. And don't be using that fast movement for activation as a, as a reason to get that. Recap on the ball slams. We'll get the big guy away from here. Uh, recap on the ball slams. Use a ball that the person can ov overcome the speed of the ball. Right? So they have to move it through space with violence. Um, and if you, you're, you don't have balls available for that, then you may have to choose a different exercise, honestly. Because you can't just you know, use a 14-pound ball or a 20-pound ball and make everyone try to get that. Uh, which leads to my second point. Make sure that it's a true slam ball so when it hits it's not bouncing because then people are going to be thinking that it's going to bounce back up. It's going to limit their speed exposure. Make sure you put it into like, repetitions of three to six in a skill environment that creates good activation and good you know, primal flexion activity when you do it. And I would really err on the side of not using it in a capacity environment uh, when people get into that. Oh, I forgot a couple of points based upon just the technique. I got so excited around telling you what not to do, I forgot about a couple of points to exercise. So the top of the movement, which you have seen, you may have seen me get way up here. The idea through that movement is to try to extend, to get it to the highest point possible, right? I want the highest point possible so that I almost have to drop. So I'm not just allowing myself to drop. I'm pulling myself down to try to flex that as much as possible. It's almost like a ski erg, right? When you notice on a ski erg, you can't just bend your hips and get all the power. You have to let yourself drop and pull at the same time. So it's the same action that you're doing, get really tall, but because I'm not pulling anything down, I have to create the pulling action to create that flexion. 
So instruct as tall as possible, way up on toes with full extension, and then get into that flexed environment as much as possible. The coordination and cueing should be uh, arms as well as the midsection and the hips will all work together in sequence. And then you can pick apart with your client if they're missing out, like if they're throwing too much and not flexing enough, if they're flexing so much and not throwing enough, that pattern should all go together in one action. And those are some good cues you can certainly help. If you're writing it for tempo, it's not gonna make any sense, right? So just write ball slams, three to six reps, uh, be violent, you know, with the movement. Uh, make sure you're overcoming load and keep reps really high quality, um, and then you'll get the greatest prescription uh, for that. A couple of sets to start with individuals so they get it. Um, and then just like some weightlifting with power movements, over time you're gonna, get a, you're gonna get a fatigue when people just do way too many reps. So to give you something to go with, start with three to six repetitions for three to four sets, and then see how they can improve quality of movement over time. Uh, because we can't measure it. But if I was to look on that person six months later and they got up to five sets, but all their four reps in each of the five sets were super fast and explosive, then that's big time improvement. So that's how we're gonna measure this going forward for the ball slam.